Hey, Bobby Manning here. Welcome to a news edition of the Garden Report. And a trade is in the books for both the Celtics and Grizzlies. Uh, one day from the trade deadline, happening just about 24 hours before the deadline here. It's probably going to be a busy one, already a busy one for uh, the Grizzlies trade. Steven Adams uh, to Michael Cole here uh, from the Memphis News. And uh, this one caught me a little bit off guard. People have kicked around Xavier Tillman, low cost option as a depth centerpiece. Celtics have been reportedly looking for some center depth here. And they trade a couple second round picks from other teams, ones that they picked up by moving back in last year's draft from Atlanta and uh, not Memphis, Dallas's second round pick uh, going to Memphis in this one. Uh, I like it. Yeah, you know, it's not a trade that I think is a slam dunk or steal or anything like that. I think this is probably good value, I'd imagine, in terms of what you were expecting uh, Xavier Tillman to go for here. Uh, but Boston probably could have stood to get a big man who could guard a couple different positions. And uh, that's what Tillman brings to the table, right? Defense, a rugged, big, physical defender who averages a steal and a block per game. Yeah, it, and it's not just a couple positions. He can He can legitimately go one through five. I mean right. that's that's his that's his game. I mean he, yeah. he prides himself uh, on guarding point guards, shooting guards, small forward, power forward centers. If you go back to the Grizzlies series uh, last year against the Los Angeles Lakers in the playoffs, I know everyone made a big deal out of the whole Dylan Brooks and LeBron James thing, but down the stretch of games, it wasn't Dylan Brooks who drew uh, the assignment against uh, LeBron James. It was Xavier Tillman Saint. And he, I know there was one situation where uh, LeBron made like a, a go ahead basket towards the end, but Tillman challenged every shot. Uh, and then there were certain games he guarded Anthony Davis. Like they they moved him around. He's kind of like a chess piece defensively. Uh, you can go into a series, you say, hey, we want you to guard those big bruising forwards in this game, or we want you to guard the centers. Uh, he's had success pretty much against every center to a certain degree from a defensive standpoint. And, you know, Jokic, again, it's 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 Nikita Jokic, for example, but uh, he had a triple, a perfect triple-double earlier this season uh, where he, he didn't miss a shot. He had a triple-double against Tillman. But if you go back to March of last season, uh, one of uh, Jokic's worst games during the year he finished runner-up to MVP was when Tillman uh, was guarding him. So uh, he is – Pretty much that's what he's going to give you. You know, it's all about defense. He prides himself there. He was Big Ten uh, defense player of the year when he's at Michigan State. And he grades really well defensively in all the uh, advanced metrics in the NBA right now. That's his game. He can guard multiple positions. Uh, he, he holds his own against guards, against forwards. And his weak areas is, is offensively. You know, he's not a great finisher. He's not a lob threat, you know, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. He has like a floater that he likes to use. But as you can imagine, you know, it's it's you know, it's kind of a finesse shot. So it's a shot that he, he makes sometimes, but he goes stretches where he probably missed three or four. Uh, he's not an above the rim finisher and he has a three point shot. Uh, you know, the Grizzlies kind of encouraged him to use it more this season after I think his rookie year, he shot it a lot uh, more. But uh, they used they encouraged him on that end and he started to shoot it a little bit more this year. Didn't really have a lot of success with it, but he, he's capable. If you leave him open, uh, he will take that shot. Uh, but overall, it, this is a you know all about the defense that he gives you. You trade two second round picks because of the fact that you know if Horford is resting for a game, or if you need just another uh, option against the uh, Joel Embiid to the world, or to throw at Giannis, or whatever the case may be, he's someone who can hold his own. Yeah, and that's something I was curious about going into the deadline for Boston. It didn't seem like they were going to do a ton, but you did look at the roster and say if one of those big men goes down. What are you going to do to get by for a couple games? If they lose Horford or Porzingis for a long period, it was going to be tough either way. But if they miss just a game or two, who can step yeah. in there and give you some playoff minutes? And that's the other big thing here, as you mentioned. He's got some playoff experience, uh, some good playoff production in the past, mm -hmm. which is something you looked at Boston's big men off the bench. Uh, they didn't bring to the table, whether it was Luke Cornett, who has no real playoff experience, and certainly in the Mayesh Keita, uh, who's on the two-way deal still, and we'll see what happens with him here. Lamar Stevens uh, goes to Memphis in this trade, so a roster spot stays open. Uh, but on that topic of the offense, the numbers are rough. 40% from the field this year, 22 from three. Got yeah. it up to 26 last year, but didn't really take many threes. Yeah. Um, 61 from the field. 
much better number, you know, on the better team last year that wasn't ravaged by injuries. And we'll get to that in just a second here. But um, I'm curious, where does he usually fit in offensively? You mentioned the floater. I heard the screening's really good as well, which is something Boston likes. Uh, and then I'm sure they'll have him take a three here or there, uh, which is how their offense is structured here. But I wonder if he'll fit in more as a solo five for them or a guy who could play alongside a Horford or a Porzingis because they love the double big looks too, just like he often yeah. played here in Memphis. Yeah, uh, he, he can play in those double big lineups. Uh, they kind of went away from it a little bit last season, but when the Grizzlies won 56 games a couple years ago, uh, and when they had the number two seed and they went to the second round of the playoffs, uh, there were significant amount more of those lineups where it would be either him and Brandon Clark, him and Steven Adams, him and Jaron Jackson Jr. And we've seen him and Jaron a lot this year. But offensively, you touched on it. His game, his biggest impact comes from his screening. Uh, it's something that he kind of learned from Steven Adams. I mean, Steven Adams is arguably the best uh, screen setting big in the NBA. And Tillman is like his kind of was his understudy, you know, for a couple years. And if you go back to that playoff series against the Lakers, uh, it's his screen assist from near the top of the uh, NBA in the playoffs in the first round because of his ability. You know, he, he hits guys in the screens. And but but that's kind of where I say his offensive potential uh, in Memphis. That's that's pretty much what it was. And you you touched on something that's important is if you look at his offensive numbers this year, should kind of obscured a little bit because of the fact that, you know, he didn't play much with John Morant. And he didn't play, you know, just a whole lot with Desmond Bain. But last season, his two-point field goal percentage was much higher uh, because he he had he shared the floor with those guys. When you're sharing the floor with Ja, Ja's getting to the basket, drawing multiple defenders. He's dumping it off to you, and you just got to convert layups. And Tillman, he can do that. You know, outside of that, when you ask him to do too much, that's when uh, things go a little bit haywire or whatever the case may be. He's not someone who's going to kind of create his own shot. He doesn't have, like, this deep array of moves. Uh, again, he has that hook shot, uh, the the post, the floater that he goes to, and he can make that floater. You know, he's capable of knocking it down, you know, a, a decent bit. He's not someone who's really going to just dominate switches. You know, if you, you throw a forward on him, a smaller forward, uh, he's really not just – he's not the best at punishing those guys uh, to pay on those mismatches. So, uh, you, again, it's for him, it's mostly the defense, but when you talk about what the positives that he brings on the offensive end, it's the screen setting. That's going to be plus. He's going to give you a lot of effort on the uh, glass, you know, in, on the offensive glass, that is. Uh, last season, I think he was a better offensive rebounder than he's been uh, this season. But he's going to give you the effort. I, I mean – it doesn't always translate to the results, but he's he's always involved in those 50-50 type balls and, and you know getting his hands on uh, balls and whatnot. So uh, I think uh, he his offensive production it all starts with the screen. Uh, quick word here from our sponsor, and we'll come back and wrap up this trade. New customers join today, and you get two hundred dollars in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, just visit fanduel.com slash Boston to sign up. That's fanduel.com slash Boston. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. So a couple, a couple more aspects to this trade we'll hit on here. I, I just want to know, DeMichael, what was he like to cover? What was it like talking to him and yeah. you know, just kind of who he is in the room? Man, he's a great dude. Uh, this is one of the better dudes in the locker room. Uh, one of those guys, win, lose, draw, uh, he's always going to be uh, willing to talk. Uh, I mean, there were a couple games where he got DMPs, and, and he still would, you know, talk to me after the games. And uh, Great, great locker room guy. Uh, he's a big family man. You know, he, his name is Xavier Tillman Sr., you know, at his young age because, you know, he's already, you know, a father. He has his family. Uh, he would come to down to the Grizzlies uh, G League games and bring his – you know, his daughter and son and, and whatnot with him. And, uh, you know, it's his family, his wife. So he he's he's very much a family guy. Uh, that's, that's who you're getting with him. You're not uh, uh, getting someone who is, you know, necessarily rah-rah, so to speak. Uh, he's he's going to come in. He's going to do his job. Uh, he's very good with the media. He's very straightforward. You know, there were times when I asked him, 
after Steven Adams got hurt, and I would say, well, what's the problem? And he he gets straight to it. Say, our rebound sucks right now. Or uh, we're not being aggressive on the glass. Or whatever the case may be, he was someone you could go to. He'd give you an honest analysis of himself, uh, of his teammates. And he, he's a big family guy. You know, he's he's very young, you know, for his age. But he, uh, you know, he, he's very focused on his kids, his wife. Uh, I think he was asked at some point, um, you know, before the season or, or when the season started, like, uh, if you could call one person right now or, or have dinner with one person, dead or alive, <laughs> who would it be? And, you know, most people, you know, they say uh, these rappers or these, you know, famous entrepreneurs and things like that. You know what his answer was? What? His answer was his wife. So because they don't, <laughs> his answer was his wife. And he said, it's because we don't spend a lot of time together during the season. So that tells you everything, you know, why everyone else on the Grizzlies saying, oh, Tupac, Jay-Z, Biggie, Barack Obama. <laughs> he comes out and says, my wife. So there you go. That's, that's Xavier Tillman singing for you. Yeah, and they could use a little bit of that straight talk, some physicality, too, on the court, just in terms of his, you know, big, um, you know, body out there. They didn't really have a guy like that, especially after trading uh, Marcus Smart and Grant Williams, two of the more physical guys on the team. They love their offensive rebounders, so it's good to hear he's going to bring that dynamic as well. I do see he's missed a lot of games this year, uh, especially last four here with the uh, sore knee, and I know he started the year with that. Uh, is there a little bit of a uh, physical concern with him? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think this this last stretch, you, you, you know, it could be a kind of contributed to what just happened here. Yeah, put on uh, ice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he was – the first game that he missed, he was actually a warm, was expected to play. And he was like a stretch, like 10 minutes before the game started. And he came on the bench and whatnot. And we never saw him play again. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that was probably part of it. You know, uh, I think he, he'll probably get over there and, and, and be ready to play immediately uh, yeah. for that team. And over the last couple of years, he's been pretty much healthy. You know, we haven't had too many uh, health problems with him a good physical big who's going to come in and play and, uh, you know, do his job. He knows his role well. He's not going to do anything outside of his role. Be interesting to see, too, as you said, 25, still relatively young, expiring contract, so he will be an unrestricted free agent this summer. Uh, so the Celtics are going to have to sign him uh, to, I'd imagine, some big bump over what he's making now, which is just $2 million. So, yeah, he's probably earned – some level of an increase over that you know what can the celtics afford to pay there with their tax level we'll see yeah uh, i i don't expect him to you know just just blow the doors off of his next contract because of yeah. those you know those offensive limitations but uh yeah yeah i think you can you can get him on good value uh they do have his bird right so um yep. but you can get him on good value i don't think another team's just going to come out there and overpay you know so to speak he, he's good at what he does. I mean, he has his positives, like we said, with the screening, uh, just the defensive versatility. Uh, like, but he has his weaknesses as well. You know, offense, uh, rebounding overall isn't a big strength of his. If you, I mean, the Lakers series will tell you pretty much everything you know about this guy. If you go back and watch the Grizzlies Lakers series, you'll see there were games where Anthony Davis kind of had his way on the glass, 30 points and 10-plus rebound type games. But you'll also see games where Anthony Davis could score. And it was when he was matched up, you know, Xavier Tillman Sr. kind of like took him out of the game and forced him to take a lot of mid-range jumpers and things like that. So that series kind of you get the best of both worlds. Uh, the Grizzlies are going to miss this guy, though. Uh, I'm telling you, he he was one. Uh, I think back to the playoffs the year before that. And if you, you're, getting, you, you're sensing where I'm getting at here, where in the playoffs he's kind of uh, made an impact in the last two seasons. I know that's something that, that people in Boston uh, would like to hear. Uh, but it was that first-round series – you remember the Grizzlies were tied 2-2 against the Timberwolves. They had no answer for Cat. And uh, I'd never seen it before with Steven Adams. But Steven Adams got played off the floor in that series. He went from starting first couple games to getting DMPs. And out of nowhere, uh, Taylor Jenkins turned to Xavier Tillman Sr. Because Brandon Clark was your backup big at that point. He turned to Xavier Tillman Sr. And he ended up starting the rest of that series uh, and being the primary defender against Carl Anthony Towns. And Cat still is, is really good, still had some success, but he kind of neutralized them enough for the Grizzlies to close out that series. Yeah, and one thing I like about this for the Grizzlies is they're getting back Lamar Stevens, who, you know, given what we saw the Grizzlies put on the floor in terms of, you know, <laughs> G League players up and down that lineup on uh, that last game against the Celtics a couple of days ago, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, <laughs> Lamar's going from 
not playing at all in Boston now to potentially starting on this Grizzlies team on a certain night and depending on how this health stuff shakes out for them, you know, to close the season here. So good for him. I think he's earned that. Uh, I Maybe Memphis is able to flip him again to a team that would want a guy like that uh, or, you know, just sort of let him play out the season in that role and maybe keep him or uh, he moves on to a new spot after the year. So I think this is good for him. Uh, I think he's better than a guy who just sits on the bench and never plays, but you know, you end up on a really good Celtics team, and that's what happens. So I'm glad he ends up in a place where he can potentially play a little bit here for the rest of the season. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, this is a good one for both sides here, I think. A couple seconds in the future. You know, who knows where Dallas and Atlanta are by then. Uh, Celtics <laughs> had some to spare. And the Grizzlies, I guess it's just a little bit of a step back here, uh, DeMichael. You know, I guess they're going to keep smart, according to all the reporting. Yeah. Despite some teams knocking on the door, Adams goes out the door for three seconds. We'll see what happens with Conchar and some of these other guys here. But unfortunately, this is where they are. All these injuries, John Morant, all the rest that happened this year. You take a little bit of a step back now in terms of some of these guys that might be, might have been leaving anyway or you know, just are a little bit more expendable now. And it's not necessarily a rebuild, but a bit of a reset around you know whatever is going to surround John Morant into the future. Yeah, exactly. That, and that's what the Grizzlies are doing. Um, it's it's not quite uh, the tax situation that Boston's dealing with, but Desmond Bain starts a max contract next season. Uh, John Moran is already on a max. And similar to Boston, they have to address the extension uh, with Jalen Brown, I think, next offseason. Not this one, but the upcoming year after that. Uh, that's the first year where Jaron Jackson Jr. will be extension eligible, and he's going to be eligible for a sizable contract as well. So he's, uh, he's super max, right? With the defensive yeah, player, yeah, yeah, defensive yeah. player of the year. So we're talking three hundred million. So uh, I mean, they have to hit the moves on the margins around those guys, and all of this reshuffling is kind of just you know uh, creating the flexibility they need to to make those moves. Well, thanks for taking the time, DeMichael. Uh, on the fly here, a day ahead of the deadline. Who knows if these teams are done? I'd have to assume Memphis will probably be looking at some more stuff here. And uh, all the reporting is that the Celtics might have another move under their uh, yep. sleeve as well here for a wing. So we'll see what happens. I uh, appreciate the insight. You can check him out at DeMichael C on Twitter. Good friend of the show here. And, uh, of course, over at Memphis News covering uh, this the Grizzlies uh, as well as Lockdown Grizzlies. So appreciate it, Michael. Good catching up. Hopefully uh, we'll have more time to chat next time. For sure. Take care, man. I'll see you.